Today we're here with another monthly update. What's happening and what will happen soon in the world of Microsoft Cloud, Microsoft licensing. And we'll discuss today also the Microsoft financial results. And uh, with me today, I have my business partner, Zaril Ullman, and midway through the presentation, we expect our cloud head, Stefan Denk, to join us to talk about Azure cost management features just introduced by Microsoft. I will uh, present you what's new in the Microsoft licensing. Then uh, we'll pass the microphone to uh, Stefan Denk, who will talk about the Azure course management. And Daryl will uh, finalize today's event with the subject of Microsoft financial year results and how it affects us. I will repeat it for the third time this year. This is a boring month. From the point of view of the changes in licensing of products, almost nothing is happening. That will affect your budget anyhow drastically. So Microsoft is still holding any serious updates to its licensing programs. Normally, they happen around October and April. Sometimes they happen mid-year, like last year with Copilot. We need to start paying attention to what Microsoft is about to release. And one of the major releases that we are expecting around October slash November is Windows Server. And there are a few changes to its licensing model. Everything you hear from us today is not yet fully confirmed until it's in product terms somewhere around October, November. It's not yet official, but this is a consensus amongst Microsoft partners and licensing experts. An interesting thing that Microsoft brings for Windows Server is a consumption model. What does it mean? It means that you will have an option to run Windows Server virtual machines, even physical machines, if they're connected to Azure Arc. It will be a pure pay-as-you-go model, like you pay in Azure, but on premises, in your data centers. And potentially, we expect it to be allowed on hosting as well. Not sure about that, but SQL Server with Azure Arc on a consumption model is allowed on hosting. So we expect that to be allowed on hosting too. Let's wait until it's released to be absolutely sure. As for the editions, there is no more Essential Edition. 2019 was the last version for Windows Server Essentials. Microsoft dropped it completely. We are only promised data center and standard editions in the next release of Windows Server 2025. It brings a lot of new features in regards to containers, virtualization, security. They will drop old security protocols. Today's event is not about the technical capabilities. Let's talk purely about costs and licensing. One of the exciting things that Microsoft promised is to finally bring hot patching to on-premises Windows Server. It's already available in the Azure edition, in the Azure itself, but it's not yet available for Windows Server 2022 on-premises. So it will be, and there's no consensus around how this will be licensed. The worst case assumption for now is it will certainly require software assurance, so it won't work on pure perpetual licenses, and it may be, it might be an add-on license. So to get hot patching, you would have to effectively pay for Windows Server, pay for software assurance, or get Windows Server on a subscription, and maybe also pay for hot patching as an additional fee. So these are the expectations around Windows Server 2025. How much it may be when the pay-as-you-go feature is available, this is not official, but some of our clients are asking for their planning, how much could this cost when this feature is released? We looked at the SQL Server with Azure Arc prices, and we noticed that the pay-as-you-go prices are roughly 20% more expensive a year than annual subscription licenses. And we did exactly the same estimation based on the available CSP price list for Windows Server data center, Windows Server standard subscriptions. The reason why we're comparing subscriptions is to compare like to like. We're not comparing perpetual licenses. We're not comparing perpetual licenses with software assurance. We're comparing pure subscription licenses with pure pay-as-you-go subscription fees on hourly and monthly basis. The difference that we are applying here is the same difference that Microsoft has on SQL Server subscription licenses versus SQL Server pay-as-you-go through Azure Arc. What else do we know about Windows Server 2025? There will be no client access licenses per hour because there's no practical reason. Client access licenses are assigned to devices, to users, and one of the things which Microsoft religiously sticks to with Windows Server is they require Windows Server client access licenses. So you not only have to license the servers themselves, you need to license each client connecting to Windows Server. The thing is, it used to be very 
simple before Microsoft 365. With Microsoft 365, that is almost ubiquitous. When the server calls are effectively included in the top tier Microsoft 365 subscriptions. If we look at our client base and see how many other users not covered with bundled calls, require standalone calls, that percentage is very low. So we're not Microsoft. We can't argue about commercial reason to continue charging for Windows Server calls, but they're not required in Azure. They're not required on hosting, including AWS, Google, any platform. When you rent a Windows Server virtual machine from those platforms, calls are not required. They're not required on CSP hosters. The only two cases when calls are required is on-premise and when you bring your own license to a service provider that allows you to bring your own license for Windows Server. These are the only two cases and they're very rare. And another thing that I really would like to see in the new release, in the new version, is the ability to use Windows Server standard licenses with Windows Server data center virtual machines. It's not a well-known fact, but if you have CSP subscription licenses, you are allowed to run Windows Server data center virtual machines and license them per virtual machine with Windows Server standard licenses. For some reason, it wasn't given to enterprise agreement clients, which is a bigger and richer, the traditional client base of Microsoft. Hopefully, Microsoft will change that. These are the expectations. And there are more products coming. Office 2024 LTC has been confirmed multiple times. Microsoft will continue providing traditional Office at least for one version. And for some bizarre reason, there's no clarity about SQL Server 2025. You would expect it to be released. There's virtually no information. And let's move on to the Azure cost management news, because as I said, on the licensing front, there's not much exciting happening. But Microsoft just rolled out a few Azure cost management features. And Stefan Denk here, our head of cloud, needs to talk about that. Thank you, Sasha. The news in Azure cost management are the release of the FinOps open consumption and user specification for Azure. This is a big one, which should have a quite significant impact on all the FinOpsers out there who are trying to work their way through the Azure costs. What it does is it is from the FinOps Foundation, which is a group of public cloud users from the industry, from the public domain, cloud providers participate in that one. It's also not just Azure, AWS, Google, but you also have uh, big SaaS providers like Salesforce, for example, contributing into this. And they were trying to come up with a way to represent the costs, which you know in Azure is your actuals or amortized consumption. In AWS, it's your cost and usage record. There is a comparable thing for GCP where the name right now eludes me. These were all proprietary formats. They were high level doing the same thing. They will give you one line per resource per day in AWS, even per hour and print this into a huge consumption record. Now everyone used their own naming, their own terminology, and you had different column names for what you were working with. What the focus standard set to achieve is to have one unified set of column names so that no matter if you're consuming a virtual machine in Azure, in AWS or in Google, and this is one example among many, you would always be able to identify this as being a virtual machine. You would still be able to figure out that this is an Azure virtual machine belonging to a certain subscription, sitting in a certain resource group, and then having the specification of the Azure virtual machine. The naming is still different, and the content which is going into the cells is still different between the clouds, but the table structure is aligned. And this is like the first 30 odd columns. Then behind that, there's all the existing columns which were in the past usage files. They weren't able to fit everything into the focus standard. For example, on Azure, there's the additional information in your cost and usage, which is giving you an explanation of what OS image are you using. Is it, for example, a canonical Ubuntu image? Is it a Windows Server image? How many CPUs are in the VM? This is some extra information which the focus standard did not foresee. And you can still pull this out of X fields, which are coming together with your focus standard. But now it has become way easier to build your multi-cloud analysis because you no longer need to harmonize multiple completely different layouts of the same information, your monthly costs. You now only have to correctly interpret and pivot on the numbers and on the different clouds. There is still work to be done on that one, but it has become way easier now to build your own multi-cloud analysis tools. And that, from our opinion, has greatly diminished the value which the established FinOps tools brought to the market. 
because a whole lot of their development went into giving you a one-stop shop to see your cloud costs across Azure, AWS, and Google. Now, Azure, AWS, and Google report into the same data structure means it's now really worth asking the question if you're going to pay an extra two and a half, three, whatever percent of your monthly Azure consumption, if you're only using these tools to get your end-to-end -end view over the three different major cloud providers. If that's the only thing that you're using these tools for, it may be a good idea to start looking into an opportunity to rework this yourself and then get rid of this extra 3% tax on your total cloud consumption, because this is, in my opinion, a very justifiable development project. And based on the standard, it has become way, way easier for your teams to actually develop that. And odds are you can even do this in Excel. Cost counts for virtual machines. Please tell us about that. This is a new feature which is made available for the credit card users of Azure. So it's a consumer feature at the moment, more than an enterprise feature. And what this promises is to give you a better TCO view right in the Azure portal over your virtual machine. So it wants to take into account right now what is the pure cost of the virtual machine and the license if you are using the license included feature, which we heavily recommend against. The subscription licenses, which Sasha showed earlier, are way cheaper. Whenever you are using a Windows server on a virtual machine in Azure, consider getting a subscription license for that rather than doing the license included, unless you're really spinning this up for a limited amount of time. As soon as you run this for a month or two, it's cheaper to get a subscription license. It's a rough rule of thumb. So what this aims at is to give you a cost for a virtual machine, including the disks which you are attaching to that. And it may even give you the feature to do an estimate on how much network bandwidth you're going to use. The first five gigabytes are free. Everything on top, you have to pay eight cents per gigabyte if you are pushing data out on the internet and the lower rate if you are pushing data across VNet peerings or into a different Azure region. Microsoft was critiqued on only showing part of the costs for a VM, again, especially in the lower end consumer or small business type market who are not under a uh, enterprise agreement or CSP. The partner would be expected to help the company understand how the prices are actually assembled. So they have now answered this for this specific service, giving you a complete cost view. The thing that we see is that the VM costs were probably the easiest ones to do the TCO analysis of because you take the VM, you add the five disks which you need to attach to the VM, and then you maybe put 5% on top to cover for network traffic and any unexpected things, and then you were there. Microsoft is now making it easier for people to understand the true cost of a service, which they would see in production. The thing is running in Azure, and this is in general a positive trend and a positive development, and I hope they will be doing this with more services, giving you some way of doing an estimation while you are building the solution inside the Azure portal so that you have a better idea what your final cost impact is, because I still see many companies getting surprised by the true cost once solutions made it all the way into the cloud. And we have AKS cost inside. This is again something where I very much welcome the direction Microsoft is going there. And I do hope that they are rolling this out to more solutions which have a shared services nature. While the consumption overview from Microsoft, I lovingly call it the line-by-line -line mobile phone bill from hell, because it can have millions of entries per month. And people just mentally switch off if they see a CSV file where even Excel says, sorry, you cannot load this, it has too many rows. This is what the FinOps community, the cost management community has to work with, and this often forces the use of tools. So they effectively have rolled out a feature that helps you only of these clusters split costs between various cost centers. That is correct. What Microsoft has done there is they looked at Kubernetes and there are two different ways to build your Kubernetes environment. We've seen once there every application is given its own subscription or is given its own resource group. So then you are forced to deploy one cluster of three VMs or more per application running. But this is not mm -hmm. the most cost efficient way of running Kubernetes because the idea of Kubernetes is like the old web servers. You want to have a farm which runs a lot of applications on top. So put many mm -hmm. containers on top, many different things and have one big cluster which has 550, 500 nodes. 
because then it's super resilient. Drain a few nodes, do some patching, bring some other things up. The cluster itself is never compromised because it has ample capacity. But then the cluster itself, where you only see the cost per VM per day, becomes very big. And what this solution here addresses is where you have an AKS cluster, which let's say costs $15,000 a month or $150,000 a month, which multiple entities, applications, business units, business entities, if you are a more complex organization, leverages, and you will need to show back costs. At the moment, you would have to do some pretty elaborate scripting to figure out which applications were running, how long, how many pods were up for a given application, and then come up with a distribution key of the costs, which is 100 VMs, running anywhere between 50 and 5,000 pods for five to 50 applications. What Microsoft now is giving you is a distribution key for the costs so that you can associate the costs of the big Kubernetes cluster into the individual components running on that one. That's especially important if you do showback and even more so if you're doing chargeback because it allows you to split basically one line in the Azure cost and usage record into multiple lines to attribute a section of this cost to the individual components it is running. What we would love to see Microsoft again is rolling these out, but if you already have a need for doing precise showback and chargeback, then we are happy to help you figure out a way to do this for other big shared type services, SQL databases, data lakes, etc. Stefan, thanks very much for this update. A pleasure. Thank you. And Daniel is back to talk about Microsoft financial year summary. So you may be aware, if you're around Microsoft, that Microsoft's financial year ends on the 30th of June. We can now look back at the Microsoft's financial year 24, and we're already in the year 2025 in Microsoft terms, and see how it affects us. Daryl, it's uh, back to you. Hey, thank you, Sasha. And this is always a good time during summer to reflect back on the previous year. Again, the previous year, as Sasha pointed out, is Microsoft's fiscal year 24 that ended end of June. And they basically already kicked off 1st of July, their fiscal year 25. So those of you that are new to the Microsoft business or that have taken on a new role, just be aware of that. It's always good to know from a negotiation perspective when is the correct end of the year, not only for Microsoft, but for any vendor that you're talking to, working with their fiscal years are spread over the various periods of the calendar year. So just be aware of that. Why is it important as procurement experts or technical professionals, being Azure professionals or software asset managers or CFOs, why is it important to reflect back on the Microsoft finances? You might be saying to yourself, I don't deal with Microsoft finances. I don't really care how much they're making, where they're making money. It's not going to make any difference in my life. That is where I want to bring a different viewpoint. If you know how successful Microsoft is or not in specific areas, where their focus is going to be in the coming year, you can gain negotiation leverage. All I do day in and day out is I negotiate. I negotiate audits enterprise agreements, CSP contracts, MAC agreements, and knowledge is ultimately power. It's all about what you know. The more you know, the better prepared you're going to be. So I'm going to take you from the macro, and then I'm going to pinpoint you on how you can actually use this in your day-to-day interactions with Microsoft, with your negotiations, and with your internal discussions within your organization. So let's start off with a high-level fiscal year From Microsoft perspective, excellent results. So Microsoft segments their business into three categories. Intelligent cloud, productivity and business processes, and what they call more personal computing. So let's start off with intelligent cloud. What's included in intelligent cloud is Azure, Windows and SQL Server, GitHub, and some additional products such as AI. So if you're going to ask me as we go through, how well is Microsoft doing with AI? I'm going to tell you, there's no actual numbers out there. Microsoft hides the granular information under the intelligent cloud segment. I'll give you in a minute my best, almost best guess based on what we are seeing in the market. And that's going to help you with your upcoming FY25 or Microsoft's FY25 discussions. Let's start off with intelligent cloud. Fiscal year revenue, $109 billion. Just to give you some proportion, big number. But what's interesting 
is that it's a 20% year on year growth. Look at the percentage growth. Microsoft's a huge company. So the numbers can get a bit intimidating. The 20% is what's interesting. From that growth, 30% is Azure. So just keep in mind where the growth is. The growth is Azure. And I'm sure you're all feeling it when you're having discussions with Microsoft. The emphasis is around Azure. It's around consumption. And I want to link back into a bit about what Stefan spoke about. And I like saying overspending or under management of your Azure infrastructure or service. Huge potential from your perspective for optimization. Now, the 30% growth is from new workloads coming in, from increased requirements on database and on bandwidth and on CPU, on core usage and so and additional services. But the third most underestimated point of growth for Microsoft is waste, customer waste. We are seeing on average over 30% waste. When I'm saying waste, I'm saying you walk into a room, you switch on the light and you go on a vacation and you're still paying the bill. And then your kids come home and they put on the light, they put on the boiler, they put on the heating and they leave the house. And your bill is continuously growing and you're not seeing more value. You haven't added another room to the house. You haven't brought another kid to the world. You're just wrongly using Azure or any kind of utility. And Microsoft's capitalizing on it. So part of that 30% growth is your waste. Productivity and business process. It always surprises me that Office is still growing. Office has been growing for the last 30 years plus, And it's still growing as part of the Office 365. So as you can see, 13% growth in total for 365 for LinkedIn and Dynamics. Dynamics is, we sometimes underestimated, but it's a pretty huge chunk of their business. Office 365 is still the biggest piece of the productivity and business process. And from that, 14% is commercial 365. And that is coming a lot of it, again, connecting back to the licensing to real world E5, moving from E3 to E5 and continuously adding on additional security components. If you have a look at your Microsoft bill, on 365, even if you do have E5, that's not the end of the game. There are so many different add-ons that you are using that's helping Microsoft grow. Microsoft hardly ever audits end customers. Five, six, seven years ago, I'd say a lot of the growth on Office is coming from audits. No, it's coming from actually delivering added value, mostly around security and productivity, and that's impacting Microsoft's bottom line. And you'll see that growth, you'll see the predictions for 25 in a minute, and you'll see where Microsoft is going with this. On personal computing, the good old Windows operating system, OEM, we might have forgotten about OEM. It used to be a big thing. It's still a big thing for Microsoft from a revenue perspective. It's a cash cow. Don't forget about that. Almost every single machine that's sold in the market is still sold with a Microsoft Windows OEM license. Don't forget that. Quite a bit of money goes into there. You've got, in addition to Windows in the more personal computing, segment, you've got Xbox, you've got search and news advertising, $76 billion worth of revenue still coming in there. From my experience, and I've been around Microsoft for a few years, the majority there is still Windows operating system. So still a cash cow for Microsoft, still a very lucrative business. 14% growth, not bad. Although 61% is growth in Xbox and content, the majority of the revenue is still coming in from the operating system. From a stock perspective, and that's ultimately what investors care about, nothing else, 25% growth on the stock price, huge. In FY23, 12 months ago, the stock was at $320. Today it's at $399. And the dividend per share has grown by 10%. One of the highest dividends paid out from a blue tech company. This is not a startup, but still the overall revenue is huge. The growth is substantial and it's continuously growing. What does it mean for you? It means that Microsoft is making money. And you know what? That's a good thing. It's a good thing because that means they can reinvest in R&D. They can provide better products and they do provide good products. Even though we are on the other side of the negotiation table from Microsoft and we represent our customers, we are very much aware of where Microsoft puts its dollars. And if you understand where they put the dollars, you can pull the right levers when you negotiate. So Microsoft's doing well, but what does this mean? Is that they need to continue doing well. They need to continue to overperform. 
And to overperform year on year is difficult. It means increased pressure on the accounting, means increased pressure on your accounting, means that they have got double digit growth metrics on your specific account. As small as it might seem to the billions of dollars of revenue for that specific account that you're dealing with, and this is the micro side of translating the bigger picture into what it actually means for you, is that they are out there looking for double digit growth. They are under huge pressure. That means that you've still got leverage. And don't forget that. Regardless of the size of Microsoft, regardless of your size compared to Microsoft, you are still important to that specific account rep and to that accounting and to that geography. Keep that in mind. So let's look at the total numbers. Always nice to see. Pretty big, 245 billion, not a bad revenue outcome. 16% year on year growth. Meaning again, going back to what it means to you, you are going to see the pressure coming in from their account reps. Again, they need to keep up this double digit numbers because if they don't bring the double digit numbers, stock price is going to drop and investors aren't going to be happy. Operating income still very high, 109 billion, 24% increase year over year. That means that they are managing their business really well. Again, what does it mean to you? It means that you're working with a company that knows how to run a business. They're not wasting money. They are making money and they're still putting back in R&D. Less than they should, more than they should. They've still got a very good business. So when you are investing your future of your business on Microsoft or on any company, it's really important to understand how stable they are because you don't want to bet your business on a company that is losing money or operating income is dropping. You want a stable partner. Microsoft is stable, making a lot of money. Operating income is up. Net income is up by 22%. Diluted earnings, 7.8, 22% up. And dividend, pretty important stuff again when you're looking at the overall health of the company is healthy. That means from your perspective, yes, continue investing in Microsoft technology, but keep in mind that you can still negotiate. It doesn't mean you have to pay any price they ask from you or the list price. The more sophisticated you are in presenting your business to your account team, the better results you're going to have. So let's look at the outlook for FY25. Revenue growth, the expected revenue growth, this is taken, this is not my estimate, as I said. I'm not a financial analyst, but there are some really smart people out there that I follow. And the average outlook is 12 to 15% year on year growth. And again, where's it going to come from? It's going to come from cloud and AI segments. So this is again, pretty huge. As I said, double digit growth. They're going to come hard at you this year, the Microsoft team. They're going to double down on Azure. They're going to triple down on AI. That's important to them. Don't just give it away. Leverage it for the low, for the basic stuff that you're still using. Leverage it on your Office 365 expenditure. Leverage it on your unified support contract. So everything connects back. It's just a web of various components that just all connect back. If you are looking at the overall bigger picture, you need to look at unified support. You need to look at your EA, at your Mac, at your CSP account. Earnings per share, EPS, again, double digit growth, 15 to 18%. Some of the key initiatives that you should look for, AI, AI integration. So Microsoft's going to double down on integrating AI into Dynamics, into Office, of course, into the ecosystem. They are tightening the loose ends, basically making moving off the Microsoft platform very challenging. Potential risk. I think competition is going to be more in the world of security. We all saw what happened a few weeks ago, played really nice into Microsoft hands. But again, security is still a very big potential risk for Microsoft. Governmental, EU, regulatory challenges in general have always been a challenge for Microsoft. Most of the pressure is actually not on Microsoft these days, is still a lot on Google. Microsoft is challenged, but I think it's a very low risk. Not much for you to leverage in that perspective. Maybe if you are a cloud service provider and you're on the other side and you're competing with Microsoft, that has an effect on you, a positive effect on you because somebody's out there looking after your best interest. On acquisitions, just keep in mind some of the most predominant acquisitions. One huge in gaming and entertainment, Activision 68.7 billion. Microsoft is doubling down on Xbox and on gaming. Nuanced communications, AI healthcare, 
substantial, almost 20 billion and a small acquisition around advertising technology, 1 billion. And I'm sure there are going to be some big surprises as well. Microsoft's always in there for surprises. So look forward to that. Quick summary, very strong performance in 24. I think Microsoft is going to have a tough year in FY25, not because they've got problems. It's just really tough keeping up the growth expectations, huge expectations, double digit, 12 to 15 percent. That's what the market is looking for. Increased pressure on the entire Microsoft board all the way up from the top down. We're going to see some strategic acquisitions to continue the growth of the business and the health of the business. They will need to go through some major acquisitions around AI, gaming potentially, and of course, around security. AI and security are going to be the two big things. And again, Azure, huge growth potential for Microsoft and for you. And I want to emphasize this. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit in Azure that you can optimize. I think your main objective going into FY25 or H2 of your year or planning for fiscal year or calendar year of 25 is you're going to have Azure growth, 25, 35, 40% growth. You can actually keep your expenditure flat. You can grow your Azure usage and keep your spend flat. I know it sounds crazy and it's not science fiction and it's not a missile technology. This is down to earth, good old fashioned management. You need to start managing your Azure assets because you're bleeding. You need to watch out for Azure Marketplace. Azure Marketplace has become a almost gray area of spend. We have conversations with CFOs that have lost control on the spend. Marketplace is like a dark black hole. Money goes in and it goes in and it goes in and there's lack of control, lack of procurement control, just lack of good old fashioned best practice governance. We've seen removal of teams from Microsoft 365. It's going to impact certain customers, not all customers. We can get into that in a minute around the EA customers that are continuing with their current software assurance or with the current subscriptions are not going to be impacted, but all new net purchases there's going to be an increase, new co-pilot versions coming out all the time, a dynamic 365 price increase, double digit price increases down the board going to hit you in October. Be aware, be ready, prepare. Thank you. Daniel, I have one question to you, and this is purely speculation because you're not a financial advisor. I've been monitoring financial advisor news for a while around blue chip companies, for example, Oracle, Microsoft. Correct me if I'm wrong. In my head, there's a magical number of the year-on-year net income growth, which is 20%. And Microsoft last financial year had some fantastic spikes up to 30% growth. You already said that it'll be pretty hard to maintain it. Looking at them right now, it's very hard to say whether they can pull any ace from up their sleeve and maintain that massive momentum. They've been, by the way, maintaining this for three years. So in three years, the growth, what was that? 58% on the share price. It's huge. Looking at what they do right now with the charging for add-ons, making Teams commercial, not bundled, commercial, Teams premium, and also assuming that audits are almost somewhere in the background. They're still going, but they're in the background. If Microsoft slows down, they will be looking for new ways to increase revenue. What do you think? What do they have? You're allowed to speculate. I think we're going to see growth. There are two types of growth that I can expect. One is around security. That's going to grow the E5 market share. The Office 365 package is still a huge component of the Microsoft growth. We saw that 14, 15%. It's still going to grow and it's going to grow through additional security enhancements. That's my own opinion. And it's going to go through AI. We all saw the price of Copilot. It's enormous. It's a premium price on top of almost the same price as buying an E3 license. That's going to continue to grow and to push Microsoft's growth. And we're going to see a lot around AI. New components, new bundles, it's going to come out. I've got no doubt about it. That's one huge growth engine. I think the second growth engine, and I'm going to be again blunt, is pure bad management by enterprise organizations. And I'm sorry that I'm blunt because I deal with this on a daily basis. When I'm talking about waste, Microsoft is building on the fact that organizations do not know how to manage Not that they want to undermanage or wrongly manage their infrastructure. The tools are just not mature. Practices are just not out there. Governance is not enough. And I don't think that there's enough knowledge in the market to actually manage these huge million dollar Azure infrastructures. 
we deal with customers that are spending tens of millions, if not more, dollars, euros per month on their Azure spend. To manage that, it's not like managing an old-fashioned data center and everything that you procure under that or on top of that. It requires a whole different set of tools and a whole different management infrastructure. And when you have engineers doing whatever the, they want in the organization, setting up whatever machines they want for 99.999999 redundancy, when they only need 99.85, that is hundreds of thousands of dollars per month savings. Microsoft, they are a very aggressive company. They know that the waste is there. They know that waste is going to grow. So if you want to be proactive and not be part of that easy growth, you need to take control. And it's not easy, but that's up to you. That's where Microsoft's going to see growth. And that's where I think your biggest opportunity for savings is around better management of your Azure GCP AWS consumption. We have a comment in that regard. The growth will be about 20, 25%. I don't think it's a bad thing as long as you are controlling your budget. Microsoft's still in a very strong position. I think they're in a better position than IBM, Oracle, all the old school blue chip companies. I think they're in a better position than AWS, by the way. Sasha, you want to add in anything? I want to answer this question. If there's a customer that has another subscription through CSP and their own development subscription through Microsoft directly, whether they have a chance to place a support ticket with Microsoft, there are contractual requirements. CSP subscriptions must be supported by the tier one CSP in the chain. If they are indirect through tier two, the tier two partner can help them open the ticket with the tier one CSP partner. If they have a so-called partner support, they can then channel it to Microsoft. But the first line of support for them is tier one. If it's a subscription bought from Microsoft, I would assume a direct subscription with Microsoft should be supported by Microsoft. Everyone, thank you very much for being with us today. And we hope you'll join us in the coming months. We always have a Q&A session every first Wednesday of the month. In addition to that, on our private profiles, on my profile, on Dario's profile on LinkedIn, we also hold audio events almost weekly on various topics related to Microsoft negotiations, cost management, cloud. We're going to introduce more Azure-related, cost management-related lives in 2025. I talk a lot about service providers and licensing for infrastructure as a service, software as a service, how to manage it in the best way. If you're new to our channels and if you survived until this point, we would love you to subscribe to our channels and just learn from what we share. Thank you again and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, everyone.